Talk She. Recorded live. Well, hi everybody. It's August 18th. Tonight our special guest speaker is Dean Clifford from Manitoba. You can find his uh, YouTube channel is Manitoba. What is it? Free Manitoba. And um, your website is, is that freemanitoba.com? Yeah, it's actually it's the website for one of the guys that comes to one of the classes here in Winnipeg. Oh, so. Okay. Hi, Dean. I'm so glad you made it on <laughs> after 37 minutes. It's, yeah. it's, the, it's the black helicopter floating over my office. I swear to God, they're stopping my computer from working. So. Oh, okay. You too, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I swear I think they put the kibosh on my, my c- cable speed because everything slows down when I do these things. and. Well, geez, no, I, I got a nice computer and everything here, and I uploaded that pro version, and uh, I was on the pro version, obviously, in the chat window, but then it's still telling me I wasn't connected, and every time I push the connect button, it just took me to get a new pin, which brought me back to the same window where I was not connected again. That is so weird. So who the hell knows what was going on? I don't know. Yeah, maybe the next time you try it, it'll be cool. Ah, well, it's all right. Uh, I, I don't know. Out. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, I've been... Speaking about you all week long, I think everybody's seen your video series and uh, it really turned on to what you got to say. You seem to put everything in such a nice, neat package. Why don't you, uh, for those that don't know who you are, why don't you give them a little rundown of uh, who you are and where you are and how you arrived at your great uh, oh, assessment boy. of um, the, what's going on here. Yeah, I, I don't know how, how great it is. I mean, everybody seems to be definitely kind of getting in tune with it because it, it, it is just that. It was simplified. I uh, got so frustrated with everything that was going on online and all these theories and all the UCC stuff and truth talk and all these other truth language and everything else going on on the Internet that, that, uh, that not one theory seemed to actually have any solutions. And I've been fighting this for 15 years now. I think I still have my last income tax filing I did uh, back in 1996. So my battle started the same probably as everybody else, which is uh, usually with a, a problem with Canada Revenue Agency. And then you fight with them for a couple of years not knowing what's going on until you – the Internet, thank God. Uh, I think one day I finally came across Eldon Warman's site for uh, DTAX Canada. And that was my first introduction to the fact that uh, the name on the birth, birth certificate wasn't me. And I, I think my, my whole world almost collapsed that day. So since then, it's been a, a long path to looking up, you know, looking what other people are doing on the internet and following theories and deciding that things just don't hold water. And then uh, I think about two years ago, uh, we were because everybody ends up operating off other people's work, right? We're operating off of other people's conclusions, and we don't know that the conclusions that they came to were correct. And so we were operating on a lot, a lot of improper presumptions in some of the court stuff we were doing here in, in Winnipeg. So we just decided we had to go right back to the, the drawing board because we couldn't trust any of the information we were working off. And that's what made us break everything. And so we decided, well, okay, to start from square one, let's break this down all right back to the very beginning. And we did. And then when we finally looked at the whole picture we'd painted by breaking everything down, we just went, holy shit. Well, now we know what's going on. Well, now it's going to be easy to proceed. So I think that's really my my history. Other than that, I'm a contractor here in Winnipeg. I was building houses and doing renovations for a number of years, buying and selling some houses. And uh, this seems to have taken over my life more recently, though. So I I think this is the path I'm on now. Yeah, we can all relate to that, I'm sure. Um, So how did you arrive at um, your process or your understanding? You know, it's weird. It's actually when I started teaching it, when I had to start figuring out how to teach it to other people. That's what. Well, how am I going to understand? What, how am I going to teach people what's in my head? So I'm like, okay, well, I got to draw it out for them. I'm like, okay, well, how do I draw it out? And then I'm like, well, people have to understand that uh, that, that the, the the name is an express trust, okay, and they have to understand that there's roles that are implied with an express trust. And then I had to start drawing it out because people like to see pictures. And the weird thing is, as soon as I started teaching it to people and and drawing it in pictures, it even became more clear in my head. So every time I taught, it actually just became more and more clear in my own head as well, and just the, uh, every new theory just kind of sprang from that. Because once you understand what's going on, it's not hard to to start to address the issue and and figure out what's going on here. And that is contract law. Everything's contract law. I mean, everybody wants to say, you know, it's all to do with trusts and it's all to do with trusts. But I mean, that's correct. But really, where do you even get the trust from? That's all a contract. So everything is a contract. Right. And so when you get a letter, or let's see here, I have a list of things here I wanted to ask you, so let me get right to that. Yep. Um, so you, 
we're in the United States. Most most of us here are in the United States. Um, what would you do in the United States? I mean, is it the same situation? Do you write a letter? What kind of a letter? These are notes that Alim, do you know Alim? He's the one that put yep. us in contact. He sent me some notes, so let me just start with those. How do you deal with these people, these IRS agents and, you know, government officials or well, imposters? I, I know without even looking at uh, at American law that it's all based on the same premise, and that is literally be, be just going by the maxim that no you know no man has authority over another man, right? Nobody has authority over you. Everything has to be contract law. So in order for you to owe the IRS money, if they're claiming to collect revenue uh, on behalf of the U.S. government, there has to be a contract in place for that. And then people would always tell me, well, the birth certificate is the contract. And I said, no, it can't be because there's no terms, conditions, there's nothing in there. All that you did was filled out a particulars of live birth when you started that. I said, so that has no foundation in law. There's no, there's no argument there. They can't provide joinder. Something else has to be going on here. And then it occurred to me, well, okay, if for, for government to even talk to a man, well, they, they can't talk to a man. They had to get us to create our own commercial entity, if you want to call it that, a vessel. Uh, agent in commerce is a beautiful one that, that I've heard people call it. I think that's great. It is your agent in commerce. It's, it's the most descriptive and perfect term there is for it. And then people would also uh, tell me, well, no, 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 the government created that. That's not yours, and that's just a load of, that's a load of crap. It, that, that's not true. If the, if the government created it, then they could create it without you, but they can't. It's something you created with your own signature and or your parents, which is yours. That is your signature because you're the heir to that estate. So the government got you to create a, 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 an agent in commerce. Everybody thinks that that automatically grants the government jurisdiction over you, and it does not. I don't care what anybody says. Um, I know that's true because I, I, I've walked out of court uh, very, very successfully against criminal uh, charges, and I, I, don't hear from, I haven't heard from Revenue Canada in, in 15 years based on a, a, a very similar argument that I made 13 years ago that I, I, complete, I didn't know what I said to the guy when I had, went to a meeting. But if you look up the word register even in Black's Law Dictionary, all register means is a public, uh, a public fact, just a recording of a public fact. That doesn't mean you're actually registered with the government as in a, a government agency. It just means that you're, you're, there's a public recording now of the fact that this agent of commerce exists out there that the government can interact with. Beyond that, everything has to be a contract. And when we started ripping apart Canadian laws, and everybody has to understand all the work that we've done, a lot of it especially, a lot of this is work on, on the shoulders of giants. There's a lot of people out there that years and years ago have done a lot of the groundwork when, when people like me were still believing that we are taxpayers. And we try to work off that. So there's other people out there that have done the research and they've gone through and they've provided the information going through the Criminal Code of Canada and all the Canada Evidence Act. Uh, I think episode six of one of my videos there, the sit-down talk room, just talking with people, I explained that if you go through the, the, the acts and statutes, you don't need to, but if you want proof of everything we're claiming to, it's all here because the Canadian government itself says in their own statutes that they only have jurisdiction over their own business. That's it. They, which is obvious. That, that, that's, even, that's, a, that's a maximum of law. That, that's a maximum of equity. You can only have jurisdiction over anything that's your own business. So what the government's done is they got you to believe that everything that your agent in commerce does is a, is a function of government. And that's a presumption. It's just not the case. And that's where I came up with the argument, well, okay, if that's their presumption, then I guess they have no problem providing a contract where I agreed to work for a certain wage or a payroll record where I performed a function of government and they compensated me because that's one of the three, uh, that's one of the three fundamental principles of contracting, right? You, you have to have consent, you have to have full disclosure, and you have to have valuable consideration, which means I was paid for my services. And the only way I could be paid for my services by the government is through the public, public payroll, public money. I have to be paid with public money. The government can't pay so, me with anything else. What about benefits and privileges? I see. I don't believe in any of that stuff. Uh, I, I do, like not everything the government gives you is a benefit or a privilege, right? And here's the reason right. for that. Um, Number one, everything the government has, they got from us. Government has nothing of its own. Everything they have is ours already. So them giving me back something that's already mine is not a benefit or a privilege. It's already mine. They're just, they're just, they just administrate everything on an administrative level and take a cut, take a percentage of their fees for administrating everything they do. So it, government can't take $100 from you and then take $25 of it for administrative fees, 
give you back $75 and say that's a privilege. It's not a privilege. It was yours in the first place. Now you only have three quarters of what you had in the first place. So it's not a privilege at all. If anything, you've extended them a privilege. We have to everything, everything. I found we had the most success when we looked at every situation going on out there and we flipped it around 180 degrees and said, well, this makes more sense. Is government extending us a privilege or are we extending them a privilege? So it turns out now that everything, and in my theory on this, and I, I have 100% faith in how correct it is, um, is everything that the government does is a privilege we extend them to do business on our land, to conduct commerce, to interact with us. That's a privilege that we extend them, not the other way around. That's the way people have to start thinking about it. They have to rewire their brains to understand that it's actually us we are the ones extending the privilege, right? That's what creditors do. I'll let you ask a question from there, I guess. <laughs> Hello? Yeah, I'm sorry. I had my mute button on. I was oh. talking to myself. Oh, that's okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> so what do you do then? You write a letter? What kind of letter? A yeah, notice? Well, affidavit? Did. Okay, well, yeah, if it's the IRS bothering you, uh, that was the background on, 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 the, on, if you want to call it an argument that I'm making now, but uh, if the IRS is contacting you saying that uh, you're required to remit uh, taxes for the legal person, right? Um, well, number one, you can't just be obligated to remit taxes for a, for a legal person. There's got to be a contractor. There's got to be a reason why they want you to remit taxes. The, probably because they're claiming you perform some function of government and they have the jurisdiction to tax anything that does business with the government, right? That's just taxation on something that's under their jurisdiction. And that would be anything performing a function of government, anything contracting with the government and being paid out of public funds. So that would be a first contact in contact with the IRS. Would you, you, you would contact them and say, well, Hang on here. I, I'm, I'm sorry, but are you claiming that I've performed some function of government that creates an obligation to file taxes with you? What, there's nothing nice. they can say to that. And if they say, well, 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 no, say, well, then, then, then what do you want? Why are you contacting me? What makes you think I have to file anything with you people? You can't force me to contract with you. You do that all on paper. Is there what a particular size of paper that you use? I, I used to think it was important. I remember one time the government got back to me with a response to something, and they said, "Thank you for your correspondence." And I said, "Oh, correspondence." I said, "No, no, that was a legal document." And I'm like, "Oh, okay. Well, fine. Maybe I should resend it on legal size paper." So I started sending a whole whack of st stuff off printed on legal size paper. I, I don't think it makes any difference. I think if you're in banking and you're printing actual legal documents that, uh, that you know between two parties. Maybe that's that's really uh, effective. Uh, it's not necessary for just correspondence back and forth between the, the courts. In fact, if you go down to the courts when you go to file a lawsuit um, in the in the in the United States, I'm not sure if that's district court or what that is. Up here, it's Queen's Bench or Superior Court in Ontario. Um, you can't file any papers on legal size. It's all got to be on regular size. Only your exhibits can be something on legal size. So I don't think that has any bearing, no. I, I created my own letterhead. I think I've sent copies of it off to people where um, people have to start understanding the administrative role that you have now over your legal person. And that's what that triangle that I was drawing there before with people was a very, very dumbed down, simplified version, just trying to get people to understand the concept. It wasn't meant to be like a, like a rule of law. Like, no, no, this is the only, this is it right here if you're not doing this. Because I don't believe in that. And I've said that right on there, that substance vitiates form right substance is the most important thing so when you so you what you want to do is you want to draft your own letterhead now so i've drafted my own letterhead with my legal person name at the top and then underneath, underneath the name of the legal person you know just like a, like a corporation uh, letterhead underneath that i write uh, you know office of the director or office of the administrator i write whatever my my role or my title is because my name Chief is your relative. executive officer yeah. yeah, executive officer. That's where the, that's where that letter comes from. The meaning behind it uh, is just establishing your title and your role. I, I don't believe that there's that there's no no standing in law. There's no law anywhere I've ever seen that says that if you don't have a certain dotted line in a certain place on a document, that it renders it void. The substance of the document is what's important, and the substance makes the form. So form is irrelevant as long as you're because. We have to remember, laws were created originally so that, so that even simple-minded people could understand what their rights were. And all you have to do is express something and express it to the best of your ability on a piece of paper and get your point across. And it's because it's the meaning, it's the intent. The intent is everything.